I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're watching the stream's online pre-show. Today we're talking about conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda's possible ties to it. Here with us in the studio is Kimbale Musavuli. He is a Congolese activist with the group Friends of Congo. Kimbale, thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me. So tell us a little about yourself. From where do you hail? Well, I uh, was born and raised in Congo, came to the United States when I was 17. I uh, live in New York City at the moment, uh, precisely in Harlem, uh, mobilizing the community there to know more about the situation in the Congo and also traveling around the world uh, to let people know uh, of the deadliest conflicts since World War II, and that's the conflict in my country. Tell Congo. us a little bit about your organization. So Friends of the Congo is based out of Washington, D.C., and what it does is raises awareness around the situation in the Congo and provides support to groups on the ground. We believe that no matter what we do on the outside, it's really up to the Congolese on the inside to change the country, and we provide them with support, uh, be it material, financial, even moral support, uh, so that they can uh, change the dynamics within the country and liberate uh, the country. Fantastic. And what kind of groups are those, sorry to interrupt, is it those NGOs or those local humanitarian groups? What are those groups you're providing support to? We focus on the youth. Uh, we uh, thank the people who do humanitarian work, but we do believe that change in the Congo will come through social justice. So we are supporting people who are so doing social justice work, such as organiz organizing uh, workshops, uh, civic education programs, or ed educating their communities. So those are the type of groups that we focus on supporting, and uh, most of them are really young people uh, under the age of 35, from anywhere from 16 to uh, 35 years old that you know, we engage in supporting their actions on the ground. A huge number of our viewers, both online and on television, are under 35, and obviously this show utilizes social media. Yes. And today we've got a lot of special guests with us. Exactly. We have four members of our Google Plus Hangout who are waiting to ask questions, to chime in with their thoughts. Uh, you can see them on your screens there. It's Claude, Julie, Arshif, and Semya, and they're hailing from all over the world, really. Two are from Kenya. One is in Alberta, and one is here in the U.S. in Nashville, Tennessee. So we're looking forward to chatting with them throughout the show. And we'll get into it a little more, Kimbali, during the show, but kind of give us a sense of how your organization and you personally even utilize social media to get your message out. Oh, definitely. And, and he, he started from a college campuses. You know, I went to a university here, and I saw the engagement of young people at my university who wanted to use social media to break the silence. They organized the f uh, first cell phone boycott. Mm -hmm. where they ask people not to use the cell phone for about six hours you know, in solidarity with the Congolese people because of the minerals used in cell phones. Uh, some of them come from the Congo. So we, with uh, use of Twitter, Facebook, it allowed us now to be in 60 countries around the world. If okay. it wasn't for social media, we wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So the boycott was a success from your oh, perspective? Yes. Uh, it was a success because it has engaged now 60 countries and almost 400 universities around the world engaging in a campaign called Breaking the Silence, they do every uh, third week of October, something called Congo Week, and they are remaining engaged, and we're sharing the information with them through social media. Without social media, I wouldn't be here in front of you. Without social media, we wouldn't be here either. That's exactly right. <laughs> we got some good tweets coming in, right? We do, and a lot of them are questioning um, the report, which is surprising because we weren't sure we'd get um, a split down the middle, but that's exactly what we have. Uh, Amibe on Twitter says, the issue is not about whether the UN report was correct or not. It should be about their motivation and leaking the report. And the report, of course, is referring to um, an addendum to a UN report that uh, accuses Rwanda of supporting um, rebellion in Congo. Um, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts a little bit later on that, but briefly. This is not the first report that has been published. Uh, so that's how we need to be looked at. The context in which it needs to be looked at is there is a pattern for the past 16 years where UN reports have, have been published and nothing has been done around th those reports. So there is a cultural impunity. When we know what is happening and we're putting a blind eye to the issue that perpetuate the conflict. And I hope this time it's not going to happen again. Looking forward to more of those throughout the show. Great. All right. Well, we'll be hearing more from Kimbala and our other guests and everyone in the Google Hangout in about 30 seconds. So stick around. You're in for a good one on the stream.
I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, is the Rwandan government escalating conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is here looking out for your live feedback. Tweet her using the hashtag AJStream. So today, Malika, in our Google Plus Hangout, we've got a really cool connection to some of the guests. We do. Two of our Google Plus Hangouters are coming to us from the Global Voices Conference in Nairobi, Kenya, and that's a conference of bloggers from around the world. Of course, for those of you at the conference, please feel free to tweet us, and for those of you at home, do the same. If you want to join in on the conversation today, use the hashtag AJStream, and we'll try to get you into the show. And next to Malika is Kimbale Musavuli. He is a Congolese human rights activist and the national spokesperson for the group Friends of the Congo. Kimbale, welcome to the stream. Thank you for having me on the show. We are very glad to have you here. Also joining the conversation is our Google Plus Hangout. We have some bloggers, and as Malika mentioned, we've got others from around the world with questions that they're going to be posing to our guests about the DRC. And you could be in the next Hangout live on our show, but to do that, you need to add AJ Stream to your circles on Google Plus, and then you could be in the stream. Hi, I'm Lila Loudon from San Diego, California. I'm 16 and I'm the national founder of Tea Party Youth and I'm on the stream. A recent report from the UN Group of Experts says that high-level Rwandan defense officials backed a Congolese military coup earlier this year. The report pinpoints the Rwandan defense minister and others as being tied to a group of mutineers known as M23. Now, the UN investigation says that senior Rwandan officials gave M23 money, political backing, manpower, and weapons. If that's the case, Rwanda would be in a major violation of UN Security Council resolutions. Rwandan officials deny strongly those claims, and they say that they are the scapegoat for ongoing problems. So what does all of this mean for Rwanda, for the Congo, and the fragile relationship that barely exists between the two after more than a decade of fighting? Here to help us figure that out is Jason Stearns. He is the director of the Rift Valley Institute, a nonprofit research and training organization that focuses on Eastern Africa. He's also the author of Dancing in the Glory of Monsters, The Collapse of the Congo and the Great War of Africa. Jason, welcome to the stream. Thank you for inviting me. Before we get into the discussion, we want to note that officials from the Rwandan government were invited to take part in this program, but they declined our request. So, Kimbale, I want to start with you. Those are some se pretty serious allegations in this preliminary report by the UN. I mean, weapons, ammunition, logistics, recruits. Do you believe that Rwandan government officials had a role in escalating this conflict, or is it a little early to tell? Actually, the evidence speaks for itself. You know, for any uh, source uh, allegation, actually, that they, uh, they showed on the report, is they had, uh, especially the one implicating the Rwandan government, they had five independent sources to back up uh, the allegations. So we, this is not the first time this has happened. You know, uh, we've seen continuously reports being published over and over again implicating uh, the Rwandan government for the situation in the Congo. Of course, Rwanda is not uh, the country that is uh, uh, causing all the ills in the Congo, but they play a role in the, uh, escalating uh, the violence there and perpetuating the conflict. So I hope with this report there will be a shift on how Rwanda and uh, Uganda, no, in this case Rwanda, will be dealt with in the situation in the Congo where it, the international community, particularly the United States and the United Kingdom, will put pressure on withholding military aid to Rwanda. That's why So is that going to be the difference? Because you said this isn't the first time. There have been reports over the last, what, 16 years? Yes, yes. Okay, so what is going to make this report different? What is it about this one that's going to create that shift that you're hoping for? It's really up even to the viewers and the, uh, the people of goodwill to put pressure on the government. Mm -hmm. We've seen in 1997, you know, Garretan published a report about the massacre of civilians by the Rwandan government. It was buried at the UN. Uh, we saw in 2008, uh, Jason Stern was the lead of uh, the report in 2008, documenting again the support of Rwanda to the CNDP rebel group. But in 2008, what happened that really helped was that there was international pressure on Rwanda. Sweden and Netherlands withheld aid to Rwanda, and that caused Rwanda to respond diplomatically by removing Laurent Kouda, a former rebel leader, from the Congo. We're hoping now the United States and the United Kingdom can do the same thing. They are, they invest half of the Rwandan's budget. So we are funding the military. The UN is coming and telling us uh, James Kabarebe, uh, Charles uh, uh, Zinga, 
uh, Charles Kayonga and uh, Jacques Nzinza are supporting rebel groups in the Congo. They have been trained. Uh, they have received support from AFRICOM, uh, the U.S. Uh, African Command, and we are still not holding them accountable for supporting praxis. So the government will not do it, but the people have to demand that the United States does it, and they have a law. Okay, that can and we'll get back that. to that topic a little more in, in the show, but first let's get a little bit from our Google Well, hangout. speaking of demands, our community is quite split. Kareem on Twitter says, it is looking for who to blame, it being Rwanda, when there are no explanations for failures. There are sim these are simply allegations, politics as usual. Uh, but across the aisle, Mila says, on what basis are these findings still referred to as allegations? Rwanda's role in the crisis is no longer a secret. With that, I'd like to go straight to Google+, Plus, where Julie is standing by. Julie is the head of the Africa desk for Internet Libre, and she's speaking to us from the Global Voices Summit in Nairobi, Kenya. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I had the, a question regarding that UN report, and I was wondering if uh, the Rwandan government uh, has in its possession now um, credible proofs uh, to deny the UN report, which is, well, apparently, allegedly said to be well researched. Thank you. Well, let's have Jason answer that. Jason, go ahead. I'm not uh, the Rwandan government to be able to answer that question, but the Rwandan government has said that they uh, will in coming days refute those allegations contained in this report and that they will produce hard evidence to show that those allegations are false. So I think we just have to wait and see. I would add that to reinforce what Kambale said, the, the, the allegations the report makes are very rigorously researched and they're corroborated not only by the evidence that they find, but by other groups such as Human Rights Watch, uh, and independent journalists on the grounds, and by myself as well. So I, I think that the uh, allegations are very well founded. Uh, Jason Stearns, I want to actually pick up on something that Kimbali had mentioned, and that was that you were working with the UN Group of Experts in 2008, and the report that that group generated at the time was that both Rwanda and the Congolese had violated uh, UN, UN regulations. My question is, do you think that at any time Rwanda gets a disproportionate share of the blame in the media when it comes to these conflicts? In 2008, it probably did get a disproportionate share of the blame in the sense that uh, both the Rwandan government and the Congolese government were supporting um, uh, armed groups in the Eastern Congo. They were fighting what could be termed as a proxy war in the Eastern Congo. Both were in violation of, the san of UN sanctions. Uh, Rwanda, the media focused on Rwanda because it was a better story to focus on uh, at the time. Um, I think now, however, there are no indications that the Congolese government is in violation of UN sanctions, such as Rwanda is in violation of UN sanctions. So right now I think that the focus on Rwanda is actually quite justified. All right. Um, for everybody on Twitter, we're going to play um, some sound right now from the Rwandan foreign minister. Everybody take a listen. We'll go to Kimbali to get his reaction, but then tweet in your reaction to Malika at the same time. I'm curious what you all think. If we could take a listen to that. Of course, Rwanda is not in any way supporting any armed group in the region. Rwanda would not participate in any destabilizing act um, in the region and in Eastern DRC in, in particular. So while we get carried away with the um, activities um, with the armed groups and the mutineers and so forth, it's very important, I think, for, for those of us who have been there before and who want peace to prevail, not to allow uh, a war of words that is now clearly uh, is starting to harm innocent people um, in the region. All right, and again, that's the Rwandan Foreign Minister, Louise Mshikiwabo. Um, she was addressing a group at the end of June about all of these allegations. Kimbali, what is your response to what you just heard? This is not the first time. No, that's the easiest response uh, to do. They have not provided the evidence uh, that uh, what the UN has published is wrong. Uh, but what we know is what we have to do on our side. Not that we have the evidence of the United Nations, that is at the hand of the United States, which published their statement on June 30th mm -hmm. around it, condemning Rwanda and saying that uh, uh, we want Rwanda to stop 
uh, supporting rebel groups. I, I don't think that Gaddafi had the same type of opportunity to be asked uh, to easily stop doing what he's doing in his country. I believe that with the case of Rwanda now, there needs to be strong diplomacy sending a strict signal that if you continue to support rebel groups, we are not going to fund you. We train the military. So whenever we're seeing rebels who are supported by uh, Rwandan generals, uh, the Rwandan government receiving military aid, that military aid is causing conflict in the Congo. And we are partly responsible in the United States and United Kingdom. So there, there are paths that we have to look at you know, to bring about peace, because this is going to continue for years. The issue in the Congo, usually Rwanda used uh, the pretext of uh, chasing after the FDLR, the rebels in the Congo. Mm -hmm. That issue is a Rwandan problem. There is no inter-Rwandan dialogue around the situation in the, in the country. That need, the international community needs to push Rwandans to come together to deal with the internal issues. And the biggest threat to Rwanda is not uh, rebels in the Congo. It's actually their, uh, their own soldiers who have defected, such as uh, General Nyamwasa, who is in South Africa, uh, who survived an assassination attempt, and all political dissent within Rwanda. So we know that the international community has to first uh, ask the demand that the aid is stopped, of uh, military aid specifically, call for an inter Rwanda dialogue, and now the Congolese solution, because Congolese also have to solve this problem. We're seeing that the Congolese government is not really responding to the situation. This is pre predictable. No, mm -hmm. The elections in November legitimize, uh, uh, didn't legitimize actually. The government of the Congo stole the election in, to, in 2011. The international community saw the electoral fraud, they did not act. And now we have an illegitimate government within the Congo that's not even able to deal with uh, the political problem that exists with rebel groups being supported by neighboring countries. So supporting strong institutions and democratic institutions within the Congo will allow also uh, decreasing the uh, conflict that is existent within the Congo. Jason Stearns, you know, that sounds like a great plan that Kimbali has laid out. And in the past, other nations have, you know, put sanctions against uh, Rwanda like Switzerland and the Netherlands. But why hasn't the U.S., why hasn't the U.K., why haven't they stepped up? There's a very long history of tight relations between the two countries. Initially, I think a lot of it had to do uh, with guilt that the United States and the United Kingdom felt for not having intervened in the 1994 genocide. Um, uh, throughout the Clinton era, for example, uh, Clinton and people in charge of Africa under Bill Clinton felt, I think, very strong personal regret that they did not do more to intervene to stop the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. And I think that led, uh, led them to turn a blind eye to what was going on in the Congo at the same time, what Rwandan troops were doing in the Congo at the same time. I think another very strong, compelling reason, and more recently, um, as those emotions, I think, have begun to fade slightly, is that Rwanda is perhaps meddling in a neighboring country, but domestically and represses uh, civil liberties in its own country. But they also are extremely efficient and good at, at development projects. So development aid that is spent in Rwanda is often spent to great effects uh, and, and with great results, as compared with many other countries in the region. In the region. There's, very little, uh, there's very little petty corruption in Rwanda. Um, and that Rwanda has made great strides in terms of health and education. So I think that every time that somebody in the State Department comes and says, well, we have to be more critical uh, with Rwanda with regards to its, uh, its behavior in the Congo, um, they come up against a, a, a lobby within their own government that says, yes, but we can't cut aid against, uh, on Rwanda because we've invested literally billions of dollars in the country over the last, um, over the last 18 years, mm -hmm. and we don't want that to go to waste either. So it's sort of sunk costs, sunk investments that they've made in the country that I think dissuade many people within the administration or, per or persuade them, rather, to look the other way sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, members of our community are also skeptical of the criticism being placed on Rwanda. Lillian says, Rwanda has no interest in DRC. DRC should man up and sort out its messes instead of blaming it on others. And Nazemba Wita says, Rwanda has worked with DRC and Kabila since 2009. Why would Rwanda destroy that relationship now? Um, with that, I'd like us to ponder that, but I'd like to go to Google Plus uh, to hear from Arship. And Arship is speaking to us from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Go ahead, Arship. Yes, good evening. Um, my question is for Mr. Kamb Kambale. Uh, would, would, Rwanda, would Rwanda be ready in a pacification process with neighboring DRC to hand Laurent Kunda to 
Angol uh, to Congolese authorities? I didn't understand this question. Can you repeat your question? Can you repeat your question one more time? I'm sorry. Would Rwanda be ready in a pacification process with a neighboring DRC to hand Laurent Kunda to uh, Congolese authorities? Well, um, that's not even a question. I, uh, I'm sorry. Let me look at it. Uh, let me bring it up to you a different way. Are uh, you looking at the problem in the Congo in the context of Laurent Kunda? And many people also right now are looking at the conflict in the Congo in the context of Bosco Tanganda. And Bosco Tanganda and Laurent Kunda are uh, pieces of the puzzle of a greater issue that exists where Rwanda support proxy rebel militias. Turning in Laurent Kunda to the Congolese government does not still uh, change the fact that today we have a new guy that we call Sultani Makenga that we have to deal with. So we will have a continuous uh, list of rebel leaders that we have to br bring to justice when pressure on neighbors, uh, Congo's neighbors have been placed. Now, if we want lasting peace in that region, we need to make Congo's neighbors be stakeholder at the peace within the Congo. We know that Rwanda and Uganda, in part, have played a role in the eastern part of Congo in the destabilization effort. They invaded the Congo twice, 96, 98. Uh, they withdrew in 2002, continued to support rebel proxy militias. They even fought each other in Kisangani over a diamond mine. Can you imagine two nations, Rwanda and Uganda, fought each other in the Congo over a mine, and thousands, uh, almost a thousand Congolese died during that conflict. But these nations are supported by the international community, specifically uh, the UK and the United Kingdom. So putting pressure on them creates lasting peace than dealing with single rebels that can be replaced any day. Well, uh, speaking of international pressure, Victoria tweets, the West looks the other way on Rwanda's role in DRC because of guilt from 1994's genocide. Um, and along those lines, I'd like to go back to Google Plus because Claude has a question he'd like to ask. Claude, go ahead. Claude, go ahead with your question. I think your uh, mic yes, might be um, muted. Go ahead. My question. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, you know, the first thing I wanted to say is uh, both um, the populations of Rwanda and Congo all want a stable uh, region. And uh, today, the United States government has a unique opportunity to end the atrocities in the Congo, especially the role of Rwanda and uh, Uganda, who are allies of the United States. Um, that unique opportunity is the opportunity that was missed by by the previous two administrations, with the Clinton administration in 1994, with the Rwandan genocide, which I survived, and the Bush administration with the uh, genocide in Darfur. And today, the Obama administration is the first to actually acknowledge uh, Rwanda's role in Congo. And what can we do in the public and in the anti-genocide movement, as well as uh, people who are concerned with uh, Great Lakes region, what can we do to have the U.S. government hold Rwanda accountable? And what tools and um, leverage does the U.S. government have? Great question. I, I want to add to that. I, I, to whom was he directing that question, first of all, James or Kimbali? Uh, Kimbali, if you'd like to answer that. Yeah, Kimbali, one other thing I'd like you to answer along with that. It's my understanding that President Obama, prior to being a president, pushed for legislation that would allow the U.S. Secretary of State to make a decision to remove aid from countries that were uh, encroaching on the Congo and creating violence within the Congo, and that hasn't happened during the Obama administration. And that's what many people do not know. Uh, it's called Public Law 109456. Mm -hmm. It was passed in 2006. And Section 105 calls for withholding of aid to any nation destabilizing the Congo. Uh, if the Secretary of State uh, has evidence that his country is doing so. So seeing the State Department uh, statement on June 30th uh, saying that uh, Rwanda should stop supporting rebel groups in the Congo, it means that the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has evidence that Congo's neighbors uh, is uh, Congo's neighbor is implicated in the situation in the so Congo. So she has evidence. Is it your opinion then that she should be withholding aid? Because that's the law. Mm -hmm. The law says so. If Congo's neighbors, uh, any nation is uh, deemed to be destabilized in the Congo, we have evidence the United States should not provide financial aid to this nation. But we have provided from 2000 to 2010 $1 billion to Rwanda. 
in light of the many reports that exist, the 2002 UN report documenting the exploitation, uh, the UN mapping exercise report that say that Rwanda could be implicated for genocide in the Congo if uh, proven in the competent court, and the latest report is also implicated in Rwanda, but we are continuing to use U.S. taxpayers' money uh, to support this Rwandan government. So if the Secretary of State is not applying this, uh, by the way, she was also a co-sponsor of this law, with us, uh, President Obama back then, if both are not enforcing it, it's up to the American people to hold the government accountable for enforcing the law that they wrote while they were senators. James, how do you get people to understand this very, very complex situation to a point where they're ready to engage and hold the government accountable? Well, the curse of the Congo has been its complexity for, uh, for a very long time. I mean, one of the reasons that it's very difficult for people to understand and to become engaged is because it's an alphabet soup of rebel groups. It, it involves countries very, very far away who are getting involved for reasons that are often very opaque, very con confusing, very convoluted. Uh, so it's extremely difficult. I think this has been the curse of the Congo. The, the, the other curse of the Congo is, is that... Um, as opposed to other massacres, other mass atrocities elsewhere, uh, it's not always entirely clear who the perpetrators are and who the victims are. Um, and I just, I just want to allude to the fact that while everybody's focusing on Rwanda here, and Rwanda certainly is a culprit in this and certainly should be singled out, uh, the situation in the Eastern Congo is complex, and there are several dozen other armed groups in the Eastern Congo, and even the M23 that we've been speaking about. Um, has multiple motives and multiple forces driving it, and it's not just the Rwanda government. So, you know, even if we remove the Rwanda government from the picture and we and we target the Rwanda government, we're not going to have peace in the Congo overnight. So it's a very complex picture, and I think it's that complexity that has really undermined um, uh, and prevented, I think, international mobilization in the case of the Congo. So it's it's extremely frustrating. And Jason, my apologies, I think I referred to you as James a few minutes ago. That's fine. It's very hot in the studio today. I think it's affecting my brain. Uh, listen, everybody sit tight, uh, including in the Google Hangout. We are going to continue this discussion in our online post show. But first, we want to get to Malika because she's got some other story leads that she's following for us today. Malika? Leeds is on the road today in Nairobi, Kenya, where stream producer Dan Ming is collecting pitches. Have a look. Hi guys, I'm here in Nairobi, Kenya for the Global Voices Citizen Media Summit. It's a gathering of 300 bloggers from over 60 countries, ranging from ages 18 to 76. Now I spoke with some of the bloggers about stories that they'd like to see the stream covering. Hi, my name is Mong Palatino and I am from Manila, Philippines. I think the stream should tackle the rise of environmental killings in the Philippines involving activists and anti-mining advocates in mining operations in several rural communities in the Philippines. Hi, my name is Sana Salim and I'm from Pakistan and I really think that the stream should cover internet freedom issues in Pakistan because it's strongly intertwined with human rights violations in Pakistan. I'm Eric from Mozambique. Uh, founder of uh, Verdad, uh, People's Newspaper. Uh, I believe that in Mozambique the stream should um, cover the growing incidence of corruption and that because of our um, increased um, discovery of natural unexploited resources, um, it has the, 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 the potential of being completely um, badly exploited, uh, as in uh, not towards the best, in the best interest of the people. Well, the Global Voices bloggers did it. You too can get involved. Pitch us a story idea by visiting our Facebook page or tweeting your suggestion using the hashtag AJStream, and it could end up on air. Lisa? And before we get to our post show, Kimbali, give us a quick explanation of what the FDLR is because we want to pick up in the online post show with a discussion about them. Yes, the FDLR are, is the Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Rwanda. Uh, former uh, Rwandans, uh, some participated in the genocide in Rwanda and mm -hmm. others are the refugees uh, who came during that time. Uh, we have about a hundred of them documented by the United Nations as part who have participated uh, in okay. the genocide in Rwanda. Okay, we're going to pick up on that in the post show, which is coming up on stream.aljazeera.com. We'll look for you online. See you then.
Hey everyone, we're back for the post show. It's streamed at AlJazeera.com. We're continuing our discussion on conflict uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo and what Rwanda's role is, if any, in funding um, mutineers in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We were talking about the FDLR right as we ended the show. Let's pick up on that. They're considered a terror organization by Rwanda, but you say there's an, a, a kind of a dark underbelly to all of this in terms of how Rwanda is, is connected to the FDLR. Exactly, and uh, it's been used as a pretext for the numerous invasions of Rwanda. You know, they have always used that as a security threat, mm -hmm. a pretext to come into the Congo. Uh, when I look at 1996 to 1998, while they were in the Congo, they were still not able to remove them. Yet they found the ways to the mines. Uh, from uh, 1998 to 2002, something has occurred. And now with the latest UN report, uh, the U group of experts is telling us that uh, some of the demobilized forces of uh, the FDLR who have been sent to Rwanda, Rwanda is sending them back into the Congo to fight with uh, the M23 rebel forces. So one I have to ask, if the, these uh, FDLR are a threat, why is Rwanda recycling them back into the Congo uh, to fight with rebels uh, within uh, let, the Congo? Let, let's have Jason Stearns pick up on that, because I know, Jason, this is something that you've, you've studied in depth. Yeah, um, the Rwanda government now is trying to get the international attention refocused on the FDLR in particular. And as Kambale pointed out, this is something that uh, the Rwanda government has highlighted, highlighted often in the past. Um, and they're now currently accusing the Congolese government of um, supporting or collaborating with the FDLR and planning attacks against Rwanda. Uh, there are, is no hard evidence of, to substantiate this as of now, although the Congolese government has in the past collaborated with the FDLR. Um, but they are trying to shift the focus towards, towards the FDLR and the, the abuses they have committed. Now, the Rwandan government doesn't really, doesn't often call them FDLR, they call them the genocidaire or the ex far in Surahamwe, and what their emphasis is on is that these are the successors or the same people who committed the genocide in 1994, and now they're trying to come back to Rwanda to finish the job. Um, the, it's a little bit inaccurate to, to the extent that the last time the FTR was able to, to carry out a substantial, a serious attack against Rwanda was in 2001, so that was 11 years ago. So it's, um, it's uh, they are a strategic threat, they still have capacity to carry out isolated terrorist attacks in Rwanda. Sometimes they infiltrate and throw grenades into bars and bus stands and things like that. Um, but they no longer have the capacity to carry out a massive attack against Rwanda. And as I pointed out before, the irony of this M23 rebellion is that uh, if anybody's profited from this rebellion, it's the FDLR. The FDLR is a mercenary force, and therefore any time that there's trouble in the region, um, they profit from it. They profit from the distraction that it provides. Mm -hmm. Well, competing views on Twitter, Felician says Rwanda is just the easy scapegoat. The UN report is simply an effort to deflect attention from its failure to bring peace in DRC. Uh, and Gail says, we can blame Rwanda today. Who will be next tomorrow? DRC needs a true leadership to halt those endless rebellions. Um, with that, I'd like to go to Google Plus, where Julie is standing by to ask a question. Julie, go ahead. Yes, I have a question for uh, both experts. I would have loved to ask this one to the Rwanda, Rwandese authorities. Uh, but do you think a special criminal tribunal is likely to be set up on Eastern Congo atrocities? Indeed, there have been more than 7 million victims, as figures uh, announced, uh, a number quite close to the one needed to set up the new Nuremberg Tribunal in 1945. So do you think uh, this is a possibility? And uh, do you think Rwanda could play a positive role in fostering such initiative for peace process. Thank you. Yes, uh, the United Nations Mapping Exercise Report in 2010 that was published had recommendations uh, for what is taking place there. That report uh, said that what was happening in the Congo are war crimes, crimes against humanity, and possible genocide if proven in competent court. And they offered uh, a solution of creating a mixed court, which uh, some of the civil society groups in the Congo are for. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the recommendation of the UN Mapping Exercise Report hasn't been, uh, they haven't been uh, implemented uh, because it's a very political problem. Even the current president of the Congo is implicated in the UN Mapping Exercise Report uh, because he was one of the commanders of uh, one of the forces during a killing 
uh, that's documenting that report, the Tingi Tingi massacre. It was uh, with uh, the current uh, Rwandan Minister of uh, Defense, uh, with those forces killing the people there. So we see within the justice system, within the Congo, um, they are not implementing some of those recommendations. I do believe there will be a tribunal. We have over six million people, and that's an, it's some uh, lower estimate of the deaths in the Congo. And there hasn't been the attention that's needed to bring about justice for the people. So we have the issue of uh, the first thing I say is there is uh, no accountability for the crimes taking place. There is a cultural impunity at the local, regional, and international level, and there is no justice for the people. It's really going to be a global movement to demand that the recommendations within the UN mapping exercise report are implemented, including what the people are calling for a mixed court uh, that would try the people in the region. Well, and speaking of the UN, Jason, I'd like to direct this to you because earlier in the conversation, we've talked a lot about um, the responsibility of the West, responsibility of the US, um, and making sure this is stopped. But I'm wondering about the responsibility of the UN. Kareem says, I think the main comment is why the UN's biggest deployment not having a blame. What's their job on the ground and DRC? And then a tongue-in-cheek tweet from Amibe who says, when it comes to the region, the UN as is, good, is as good as Internet Explorer. It is on your PC, but you don't need it. Uh, so Jason, could you talk a little bit about the UN mission that is there in the country and, and what's their role in this? First of all, we should distinguish between the UN mission in the country and the UN group of experts. They're two completely different organizations. Definitely. And in fact, the UN group of experts has in the past uh, made allegations against the UN peacekeeping mission um, when itself has committed abuses in violation of the UN sanctions. Um, so they're two very different organizations and the report that we're talking about is not from the UN peacekeeping mission, it's from a UN group of experts that reports straight to the Security Council. Um, the UN peacekeeping mission is indeed one of the world's largest and most expensive. It costs $1.3 billion a year um, and it has been widely criticized for many things. I think that um, there are some unsung successes of the mission. It, it, it shepherded through the peace process since the signature of a peace deal in South Africa in 2002 until elections in 2006. There were many places along that road where the peace process could have faltered. And I think it was in, in large part thanks to the UN that in the political level they were able to push that through and to shepherd that process through against all odds to, to a certain extent. Um, they helped with the 2006 elections. Uh, the problem is that since the 2006 elections, politically speaking, they've, been, they've become more and more irrelevant. Uh, the Congolese government doesn't really consult them anymore with regards to the political process in the East, neither does the Rwandan government. All of the peace deals that have been struck since 2006, particularly with regards to the Eastern Congo, uh, have been done in exclusion of the UN peacekeeping mission. And so they're really there to do what they do worst, which is protection of civilians. Uh, protection of civilians uh, with some 18,000 soldiers in an area, the eastern Congo, an area the size of California, is, is extremely difficult. It's extremely, extremely difficult. And of course, we should criticize them, and they have failed many times. Um, but the logic for me doesn't ring entirely true. It's not because the UN peacekeeping mission has failed to protect civilians that we should excuse the culprits for committing violence. That, to me, doesn't necessarily make sense. After all, it's not the United Nations that's uh, rounding up people and killing them or starting a new rebellion or um, profiting for off, off local resources, as some people allege. It's, it's these armed groups. So we can, we can certainly accuse them of negligence, and we should criticize them for that, but we shouldn't confuse that with being the source of the problem in the Eastern Congo. Interesting and valid points made there. I'd like to go one last time to Google Plus, where Claude is standing by. Uh, he'll make his comments short, but as Claude mentioned earlier in the program, he is a survivor of the Rwandan genocide. Claude, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to ask Kambale, what do you say about Rwanda's um, stated reason for returning to the Congo over and over uh, in pursuit of the FDLR? And what is Rwanda, the Rwandan government's contribution to the growing numbers of the FDLR in the Congo versus the Congolese government's uh, growing uh, contribution to the growing numbers in the Congo because they're both blaming each other? Kimbali, you got about 20 seconds to answer that. Uh, 
Well, a uh, short, uh, short answer is uh, the Rwanda genocide should not be an excuse to allow the massacres in the Congo. Six million is, is a lot of people who have died. Uh, it's time for the international community to hold the Rwanda government accountable for the issues, uh, the, the continued interference in Congolese politics by enforcing their own law in the case of the United States. Kimbali Musabule, thank you so much for being here. Jason Stearns, thank you. And thanks to everyone in the Google Hangout. On our next show tomorrow, young and jobless in Nigeria. We're going to examine the causes and possible solutions to increasing unemployment rates in that country. And we are talking up to 50% for the younger population. Send us your comments on that. Until then, we'll see you online.